our Lord and Savior, actually rose from the dead. Three days after he gave his life a sacrifice for sinful human beings like you and I, so that we can be saved, so that we can have a relationship with God and be true worshipers of God, to know him and love him for all eternity. That's a wonderful thing. So I'm excited. I'm excited. It's a beautiful day out, out, uh, outside, and um, I'm hoping that you're, uh, you're able to enjoy this day today in every way, that you can enjoy, enjoy your time here as we worship the Lord. We can enjoy our families, and uh, that the Lord would just bless us all day today. Amen? Would you stand with me? And we're going to sing our opening doxology. If you need the lyrics, it's going to be the first hymn in your hymn book. The title is called Glory Be to the Father. All right, here we go. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. 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 If you will, uh, hear the word of the Lord out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 1. And here is the word of the Lord. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Some have died. After that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you in the name of your precious son, Jesus, and we pray Understanding that there's only one way that we can come to you, and that is through his name. It is by his shed blood, his sacrifice for us that made the way for us, Lord, to have an audience with you. Lord, we can come boldly before your throne of grace, and we can find grace and mercy to help us in the time of need. And Lord, we confess even now, Lord, that we need you. We need you every hour. Lord, whether we acknowledge it or not, to breathe in and out, to live every moment of our life. It is by your hand, it is in you that we live and we move and we have our being. Lord, you created us and you are our sustainer. You, you keep us, Lord. 
And we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us, even when we are unfaithful. And as we come to you, Lord, we look to Jesus Christ, who is that lamb, that sacrifice for us, by which we are accepted with you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. Lord, if we are honest, we are sinners, and the scriptures are true, that all have sinned and fall short of your glory. And Lord, we ask that you would forgive us. Lord, that you would give us grace to honor you, to worship you this hour. Lord, as we have been gathered together by your hand, we thank you that we have made it here safely to do so. And those who are yet coming, Lord, give them traveling mercies to make it here. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Lord, we praise your name because you are worthy to be praised and to be exalted, to be worshiped by all of your creation. Lord, even us, especially us, Lord, may we do that today. Grace us, Lord, in our, in our praying, in our singing, in the preaching of your word, Lord, in our hearing today, in our fellowship today. Lord, may you be exalted in Christ. Show us your glory today. Show us the splendor of who you are, how wonderful you are, how lovely you are. Lord, show us, Lord, your love, your grace, your mercy that is found only in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Thank you once again. We pray for every church, Lord, every gathered together body of, of, of Christians, of believers that are doing what we're doing even now, Lord, today on this special day. We pray for them too, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would keep them, especially our brothers and our sisters across the world, Lord, who are suffering, Lord, just for being named as Christians, those that follow Christ. Lord, we thank you for the freedom to worship you, and may we do this, Lord, with excitement, Lord, with gratitude, remembering what you have done for us. Thank you again, and we commend this time to you. It's in Jesus' name, and for his sake we pray, amen? Amen, amen, amen. 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 Welcome. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Tracy Campus is good to see you. If this is your first time uh, being with us, we say welcome. And uh, we're not going to prolong anything. We are going to sing uh, to the Lord. So if you will take uh, your hymn book. Actually, excuse me, the first, uh, the first song that we're going to sing is, is going to be in the insert. So if you have a bulletin, you have an insert like this. And it will have the lyrics to our song. And the first one we're going to sing is the king in all his beauty. The king in all his beauty. Here we go. Oh, lift our eyes to heaven, see the Holy One eternal. Behold the Lord of majesty, exalted in his temple. As symphonies of angels praise, now strain to sound his glory. Come worship fall before his grace, the King in all his beauty. How worthy, how worthy, how worthy the King in all his beauty. Verse 2, now see the King who wears a crown. One made of shame and splinters, the sacrifice for ruined man, the substitute for sinners. 
as earth is stained with royal blood and quakes with love and fury he breathes his last and bows his head the king in all his beauty how worthy how worthy how worthy how worthy the king in all his beauty now see the savior lifted up the lamb who reigns in splendor the hope of every tribe and tongue his kingdom reigns forever bring praise and honor to his courts bring wisdom power blessing for endless ages will adore the king in all his beauty how worthy how worthy how worthy how worthy the king in all his how worthy how worthy how worthy how worthy the king in one more time how worthy how worthy how worthy how worthy the king in all his beauty amen amen he is worthy of our praise. It's interesting. Uh, we had a service on Friday uh, with our, our home church over Grace Bible Church Hayward. And one of the things that was mentioned by our pastor was that it's very controversial these days to say or to imply that Christ is king. It's very interesting, right? It's, very, it's a very politically charged statement today. But the reality is, whether you like it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, Jesus Christ is the King. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? And I pray that God will grace all of us to see him as beautiful. Not in an awkward way, in a way that you recognize his majesty, his authority, his power and his grace and his mercy upon us who don't deserve that grace and that mercy. That makes him beautiful. It makes him attractive. It makes him one where you say, I want to know more about him. I want to understand who he is. I want to know him. And that's why we sing the king and all his beauty. Amen. 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 God is so good. He's so good. He's so good to us. He's so good to us. Well, the next song that we're going to sing is Christ the Lord is Risen Today. This is going to be a special song where we're going to have our choir come up. You can remain standing and you can sing with us. The lyrics is, are also in, um, on your uh, insert right here. If you guys will come up, those who are in the choir. Let's, can we give them a hand? Come on.
That is something to sing about for sure. <laughs> that he is not dead. You know, they haven't found his body yet. All the, all the wonderful technology we have these days. Just in case anybody's a critic in here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And because he's not dead, we have a hope for eternal life. That physical death is not the end. That we will be raised again just like he was raised. I'm so thankful. Thankful to the Lord for his mercy. We're going to prepare to read the scriptures. So if you will take your copy of God's word. And turn with me to Luke chapter 24. This is going to be uh, the text for preaching this morning. Thank the Lord for preaching and for teaching. And as you turn there, I'm not going to belabor the announcements, but just to let you know, there is another insert here with announcements, weekly announcements. So if you want to follow uh, what we do, uh, what we have going on for the month, please look at that. Also on the very back page has our weekly services, um, including our, uh, our prayer on Monday nights, uh, Bible study on Thursday nights. Uh, just thankful that the Lord has graced us to be able to, uh, to minister in those ways and to uh, receive edification. Um, those things are very important for our growth, our spiritual growth. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12, and then we're going to jump to verse 33 and read through 48, just to let you know where we're going. All right. Hear the word of the Lord, Luke chapter 24, verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they... And certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. I'll jump over to verse 33 with me. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself 
stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Amen? Amen. Amen. We pray that the Lord would bless the reading and the hearing of his word and that he would also bless the preaching and our obedience to his word. Would you stand with me one more time? We're going to sing our last hymn before the preaching. And this one is in your hymn book. It is hymn number 83. Hymn 83. The title is The Power of the Cross. to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on a road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then. Nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. To the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross. Verse 2. Oh, to see the pain written on your face bearing awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood stained brow this the power Stand 
and forgive the at the cross. Now the daylight flees, now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life, thinness the victory cries, this the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us took the blame bore the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross oh to see my name written in the wounds for through your suffering I am free death is crushed to death my life is mine to live one through your selfless love this the power of the cross son of god slain for us what a love what a love Cross. Can we do that one more time? This the power. This the power of the cross. Son of God, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a love, what a cause. We stand forgiven at the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Even though we weren't there, we, through the preaching of the gospel, when we hear the message, of who Christ is and how he died. What we should do is put our feet on that holy ground and see Christ with our mind's eye. See him suffering and dying. You got to make it personal for me. For me. See him suffering and dying for you. Believe that he did that for you. It's the only way. It's our only hope is that he died for us to make a way for us to be made right with God. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us in the preaching of his word. You pray with me. Father, holy God, we come to you as we always do when we gather. We pray. We beg of you, God. Please have mercy on us this hour. Grace us, Lord, to hear the truth of your word. To hear it, Lord, not just with our physical ears, 
but give us a spiritual hearing. Help us to hear it with our soul, to receive the truth of your word with our whole heart. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us now by your spirit and do for us what only you can do. And that is grant us the faith to believe it to be true. We pray, Lord, that you would save your people, that you would sanctify your people, grow us up, give us a heart to love the truth that we may not perish, that we may have eternal life. Bless the preacher. Speak to us through him. Call us by name and grant us grace to obey your word and to worship you as a right response to what we have heard. And it's in Jesus' name and it's for his sake we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday to each and every one of you. It is a blessing for us to be out here, to be here this Sunday morning, where we get to meditate on specifically the greatest miracle that has occurred down here upon this earth the greatest and most impossible and most unbelievable thing, and that is that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead bodily and is alive today. I have some questions for you, though. Do you believe that Jesus is risen indeed? Is he risen for real, alive and well today? Or is this a fairy tale, a myth, a figment of our imagination, like the imaginary Santa Claus who flies in the skies on early Christmas morn, miraculously squeezing his chunky self into the chimney to drop off gifts and coals to those who are either naughty or nice. Is Jesus risen bodily? See, this claim is the foundation of the church's existence. It's the foundation of the church's salvation. It is the, the, the foundation of the church's justification, how every single sinner that's saved by grace is made right with God. It is the foundation of our hope for glory. This claim, if true, makes the church invincible against Satan, against sin, and this present world system. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, rendering this claim to not be true, then, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, every prophet before Christ and preacher after Christ has lied and cannot be trusted. If this is not true, everyone who believes this claim believes a lie and therefore believes in vain and is without hope. And our most miserable men and women on this planet 
still in our sins and heading to hell. Those who died believing are utterly lost. And we are the most delusional people that ever existed in human history. If the claim of Jesus is risen is not true. But based upon the facts testified in the word of God, the 500 plus eyewitnesses who have not only seen and handled the resurrected Christ, I get the privilege to announce to you, together with a whole history of godly saints, to say this one fundamental thing, that Jesus Christ is risen indeed. Lee Strobel, a journalist who investigated the historical Jesus claim of deity, he investigated his life. He scrutinized his death and resurrection to disprove the claims of Christianity and found them all to be true. After he realized the undeniable evidence found in the empty tomb of Jesus on the early Sunday morning, as our, our deacon read here in Luke 24, verses 1 through 12, he, he realized that it was not conclusive proof of the resurrection of Christ by itself and needed further examination of additional evidence regarding the resurrection of Christ. So he was essentially saying, although the, the empty tomb is proof of the resurrection, we need more. Yes, the stone has been rolled away, and yes, it looked like he just got up from the grave, and the grave clothes went right through him, and he just got up and out. But we still have a missing what? Still have a missing body. And by the way, we have had a missing body case for over 2,000 years. That should tell you something. But he says, in his mind, as an investigator, we need more. And in his book on the case for Christ, he illustrates this point in the following. Here's what he says. I want you to hear it. He says, in 1963, the body of a 14-year-old Addie Mae Collins, one of the four African-American girls tragically murdered in an infamous church bombing, was buried in Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama. For years, family members kept returning to the grave to pray and leave flowers. In 1998, they made the decision to disinter the deceased for reburial at another cemetery. When workers were sent to dig up the body, however, they returned with shocking discovery. The grave was empty. Understandably, family members were terribly distraught. Hampered by poorly kept records, cemetery officials scrambled to figure out what had happened. Several possibilities were raised. The primary one being that her tombstone had been erected in the wrong place. Yet in the midst of determining what happened, one explanation was never proposed. Nobody suggested that young Addie Mae had been resurrected to walk the earth again. Why? Because by itself, an empty grave does not a resurrection make. This is why. And while there was an empty tomb to examine regarding the Lord Jesus Christ's missing body. And although this has been a 2,000 year issue, it does not automatically or necessarily follow that the Lord had risen from the dead. It is not conclusive evidence by itself of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, although it does support it in many ways. 
In addition to this, I want to I want I want to bring to your attention something else. There is no evidence in scripture of people who saw the resurrection. What I mean by that is this. You didn't have somebody in the tomb sitting in the tomb with Jesus while he was dead and saw a body vibrate and stand up and, 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 and take off the wrappings and fold them up and roll back the stone and, 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 and wild the guards and then left. You don't have that recording in scripture. You don't have anyone in the tomb that sees what happens because this resurrection is what we call a mystery. But here's something that's so amazing, brothers and sisters. We don't need to have seen this miracle take place. We don't need to see him rise from the dead for it to be a reality. Scientists are all about cause and effect. They believe that dinosaurs used to exist not because they were there, but because they study the fossils. When it comes to diseases that originated they, don't, they didn't see these diseases that originated and formed. What they study are the symptoms of these diseases. They study the outcome and the effects of these diseases, and they believe that these are true diseases that formed. See, we don't need to see Jesus rising from the dead. We need to look at the evidence of the resurrection. Did Jesus really die and if so, did he really raise from the dead? And if so, who saw him raised from the dead? And how many people saw him? In fact, did they not, did, did, if they saw him, how come we don't think that it's a delusion? How come we, what right do we have to believe that they saw him? They all could have been under a strong delusion and believed the lie. So the next question is, not only did people see him, but did they touch him? Did they handle him? See, for Christians, what, what we mean by Jesus being raised from the dead, we actually are basing that belief off of not imagination, but facts that have been scrutinized for thousands of years. See, this claim of Jesus being risen from the dead is falsifiable, meaning if someone makes this claim in their day, someone can take that claim and actually take these people to the court and, and try to disprove that claim. Do you know what the good news is? The resurrection claim has never been falsified. It has never been falsified. Not one time. Jesus is what? He's risen. I want to jump right into it. If you are in Luke 24, look at verse 33. I want you to see this here in verse 33. Let's talk about it, because what we're looking at now, last year we talked about the empty tomb. This year we're going to look at the evidence of the resurrected body. In verse 33, here is what we find. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. Point number one in your outline, I want you to look at the common confession of believers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ proclaimed. Now I want you to mark something. These two men who were on the road of Emmaus, they met the Lord Jesus um, and they didn't recognize him. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And, and they were sorrowful. And by the end of their conversation with him, they had been filled with a little bit of joy. And then they fellowshiped with him. And he broke bread with them. He broke bread. He thanked God for it. And he gave it to them. 
And when he did that, their eyes were open and they knew him. They knew him. Look at, look, look, look at here in verse, uh, in verse 32. In verse 32. I'm sorry, verse 31. After he broke bread and blessed it and break it and gave to them, and their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our hearts, what, burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened, the, opened to us the scriptures? Their hearts were burning. And so why did they get up? And why did they make a nine mile trek back to Jerusalem? What were they intending to do? To tell everybody that he is what? Risen. And I want you to get the picture. They're so excited. They're on an evangelical journey. They, their hearts are burning. They, they got a revelation from the Lord. And by the time they get there, they open up the door. And before they can say, he is risen, the 11th say, he's risen indeed. <laughs> they beat them to the punch. And they came nine miles away. He's risen indeed. What joy unspeakable, what ecstasy, what excitement of, heaven, of heaven's good news where they come with expectation filled with this good news and they get fed themselves <laughs> by the 11. And that lets you know that the Lord is in more than one place at the same time, isn't he? They come to meet. Haven't you ever met someone from afar? that knows the Lord like you do? Isn't that refreshing? To know the Lord rules heaven and earth and all around the globe and that we have the same love for the same Savior. What I want you to mark in subpoint A is the unanimous testimony of the church. Here is what they say in verse 34 saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. I want you to mark this. First of all, it's a collaborative confession with the angels. The, the angels say the same exact thing. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, by the way, when you see an angel, you're not sitting here pinching its cheeks like it's cute. But, the, but, but angels stand in the presence of God. And they radiate the glory of God. And it brings about fear in our hearts. As they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. They said unto them, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here, but is what? See, same testimony of the angels. But also, it is a testimony, it is a confession of those who have been converted. Do you know these people that are saying he is risen in verse 34? They, there was a time when they didn't believe this. You know that, right? So I want you to look at it here. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they what? So they didn't even believe him. So look, here's the thing. This is what I love about the word of God. It records everything. It lets you know that, that, that naturally us as human beings hearing about someone raising from the dead is an as unbelievable as anything that we can possibly think of. We, that doesn't happen down here. <laughs> Don't we wish that it happened? Don't we wish it? But it doesn't happen. It's not a part of the norm. 
is alien to our very existence. So the apostles, as human as they are, they heard the testimony and they did not believe. They did not believe. But now they're saying, as the two men of Emmaus come in, he is what? Risen. He's risen and appeared to Cephas, to, to Simon, to Peter. But this unanimous testimony of the church is a conquering confession of the church. What we are saying when we say Jesus is risen is we're saying that he reversed the curse of God's wrath. He conquered death. That's what we're saying, that he triumphed over death, that he has victory over death, that he has power over the grave, that he is the resurrection and the life, and that death has no more sting and it has no more power because Christ is risen from the grave. This is what we mean. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 through 57 says, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see the unanimous testimony of the church. But look at some point B. I want you to look at the uniqueness of their testimony. By faith in the revealed report. Now see here, if you look at verse 34, what you see after they say, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon, the implication of that statement is that they believe Simon's report of having seen him with his own eyes, but they have not yet seen him bodily. They have not yet seen him. I mean, it's obvious from the context, from the reading, because he shows up and they start tripping, All right? By the way, how can you be so confident that he's risen and then when he shows up, you start tripping? You're afraid. That's a good question, isn't it? We're going to get to that. But here, the uniqueness of their um, testimony, even with the two boys uh, that, that, that were on the road of Emmaus, and then also with these men, these 11 men, these apostles, they heard from Peter. They heard from Peter that Jesus is risen and that he saw him with their own eyes. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 5, testifies that, that of, of the order of how our Lord appeared to everyone. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, and I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says and how he has the chronological order of Jesus' appearance. I want you to see it. 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3, I love this. We're going to return just to these couple of verses in, in, in a moment down the line. But verse 3, it says, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I have also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the what? And that he was buried and that he rose again all, the third day according to the what? And that he was seen of who? Then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains until this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and then of all the apostles and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. I just want you to mark something here. Whenever you have uh, people coming to um, a court trial and they're all giving their testimony and, and there are about 500 plus people and most of them don't even know each other and they're giving the same testimony, what does that mean? <laughs> that is true. 
See, this is what we call the evidentiary method. Many people saw the resurrected Christ, and this is the testimony that we have found in God's holy and precious word. But here's what, what I, want, one, I, I, I want us to mark is that um, these men in our passage in Luke 24, they're believing uh, Peter's testimony before they actually see him. Now, I want you to mark something. That the resurrection of Christ, as we continue to progress in this lesson, it's going gonna, it's gonna to dawn on some of us who haven't really considered that he actually really came to this earth, walked this earth, died on a cross, and actually rose from the dead and is the judge of heaven and earth and will return. And now we actually have to really get to the serious business of whether we truly believe him or not. Right? This is, this is important for us. And I, I'm so thankful that we have holidays in America. Even though it's a pagan Easter Sunday that where you, 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 you have rabbits with eggs, even though they don't lay eggs. I don't know what that's all about. Um, you, you hide them, and maybe they're ashamed of the eggs. I don't know. Um, and, and we go looking for them. But, but this, is, this is a beauty that we get the opportunity of sharing the gospel, of focusing our lens on this resurrected Lord of the church whom our hearts love and never have seen. See, they are believing in someone else's testimony, which is good. Now, the two on the road of Emmaus did not recognize him, but according to their testimony was made known through their communion with him in the breaking of bread. Just think about it. In the midst of the Lord, Breaking the bread and blessing the bread and giving them the bread, their eyes were open. See, in the midst of the gospel being preached, in the midst of exposition of scripture and the bread being broken and, and blessed and given and distributed and feasted upon, you come to know of the crucified and risen Lord of glory. Amen. This is how you come to know him. And this is how they came to know. They, their spiritual eyes were open. But I want you to mark something. They came to know him spiritually. They recognized him spiritually, even though they didn't recognize him physically. They didn't recognize him physically. Look at Luke 24. I want you to see it in verse 30 and 31. Look at this. I want you to see it. In verse 30. Verse 30, it says in Luke 24, And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them. Oh, you know, let me back up. Not, 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 not that verse. Uh, let's look at verse, let's look at verse 15. Verse 15, verse 15. Verse 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near. And went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not what? All right. So they had a kind of blindness as they were walking with him and talking with him. They did not recognize that it was the risen Lord. Turn with me to Mark 16. I want you to see something interesting. The Gospel of Mark. Mark 16. In Mark 16... And this started at verse 9. Look at verse 9. It says this. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, of whom had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, and they mourned, uh, as they mourned and wept. And they went, uh, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, they what? They believed not. Look at verse 12. After that, he appeared in another what? Form unto who? Two of them. And they walked and went into the country. I want you to see it. See, this is a mark talking about these two men that were on the road of Emmaus. He appeared in a different 
form to the point where they could not recognize him. And so the lesson that we have to understand is that what God would have his people to do is to actually recognize him, not necessarily in a physical form, but according to the testimony of God's word. Because that's what he talked to them about on the road. He opened up the scriptures. Their hearts were burning and they believed the word of God. And as they were communing with him, communing with the word made flesh, raised from the dead, they recognized him. Do you recognize him, saints? Have you recognized him? If you go back to Luke 24, this is the point that they both had in common, the 11 and the 2. They believed the, the, the report or the scriptures concerning the Lord, although they have not recognized his physical form, which explains what happened when he showed up. <laughs> See, this is important for us to grasp. Now, subpoint C, and we're going to move through this quite quite. Uh, quickly. See, the understanding of the church's testimony, Jesus as God really uh, accomplished all of our redemption. W when we say Jesus has risen from the grave, when we say that he has been raised up by the power of God, what we are saying is that the resurrection of Jesus is the supreme proof and vindication of Jesus' claim of being the one true God. See, his resurrection proves that he is the one true God. See, in John chapter 10, verse 17 through 18, I'm just going to quote it for you. You could turn there, and this is one of those passages where I, I, I take delight in just, just musing through it. It says, therefore, uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you turn it. I think one of these are on. Okay, it's off. Okay. In uh, John chapter 10, verse uh, 17 and 18. Yep, we're good. Verse 17 and 18. He says this, brothers and sisters. He says, therefore, does my father love me? Because I lay down my life that I might what? No man takes it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. So what are you saying? Jesus is saying that it was by power that he laid it down, and it was by power that he rose again, that he rose himself from the dead. Can anybody explain that to me? I know. It's like, how can Jesus raise himself from the dead if he's what? Well, he's not just 100% man. He's 100% God. He says this, I'm going, to, I'm going to read this again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment, mark this, this commandment have I received of my Father. Do you know that although when we consider the cross of Jesus Christ as the passive obedience of Jesus Christ, and it so much is the passive obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, when we hear the words, it is what? And Father, I, I commend into your hands my spirit. And when it says that he bowed and he gave up the ghost, that was him being actively obedient to his Father. He gave up the ghost but also him being raised from the dead was an act of obedience. I don't know if you've considered it before, but it was an act of obedience. He rising from the dead on the third day was him obeying his father's command. It was active obedience in his resurrection. 
And so when you look, when you consider the kind of righteousness, Christian, that you have been uh, gifted with, that, that's charged to your account, we're not just looking at the life of Christ and the death of Christ, but we're looking at the resurrection of Christ. Because what we believe is that when he raised, he raised for our justification, for our right standing before God. This is what it says in Romans 4.25. In Romans 4.25, he makes it very, very clear. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Yes, he was raised for our right standing before God. That's what we mean. He, him raising for the... Like, we, won't, we don't have a right standing without his resurrection. Not only that, but he triumphed over Satan... He triumphed over sin. He triumphed over death. He disarmed them. The, I was talking to my son uh, last night, and uh, I said, what, what power does Satan have? Or did he have? The, the power that he had was death. Right? Death. And none of us had any power against it. None of us did. All of us would have to experience it one day. We have loved ones that have died, don't we? See, we're helpless and hopeless against this foe, against this enemy. And Jesus disarmed him completely and totally. <laughs> See, think about this. In his passive obedience, he, the enemy thought he was winning. The enemy thought that he was winning. And when he gave up the ghost, he thought that he had won. But he realized something. He didn't have a weapon anymore. And he was trying to figure it out for a couple of days. I feel... Weaker. I should feel stronger. And then Jesus raised from the dead with the keys of death and hell in his hands. <laughs> Utterly disarming him, having all power and authority. He's the one. He's the one alone that sends people to hell. Jesus. And that saves people from hell that saves people from the wrath of God. He has the authority and he has the power to do just that. This is what we mean by the resurrection. So much more. He is the only path of eternal life. We, and, and, and we have this glorious hope, brothers and sisters. You know what hope we have? One day, <laughs> one day, we gonna have a brand new body. That's fashioned like to his resurrected body. Oh, that's our hope. So we as Christians are able to face death. We're not trying to run from it. We're not trying to figure out how to live a lot longer. We know how to face death because we have hope beyond the grave because of, of Jesus Christ who is risen. See, this, this is our hope in life and in death that our Lord Jesus has risen. And if you put your trust in him, that is the hope that you have as well. Now, I have so much more to say, but let's think about this. I want to quote Philippians 3, 20 through 21 as we go into point number two. Paul says, for our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Question, are you looking for him? See, as we're reflecting on the resurrection, we should not only be looking to him, but looking for him. Because he is what? He's alive. For our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto, uh, like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. 
I can't wait for that new body. How about you? I'm looking forward to this. But look at point number two and go back to Luke 24. Point number two, not only are we looking at the common confession, but we're looking at the concrete corroboration of the body of the resurrected Christ proven. I want you to see it here in Luke 24. Look at, look at verse uh, 36 in Luke 24. Verse 36, and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, peace be unto you. Now, let, 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 let's just, just entertain me for a moment, brothers and sisters. It's just a few days after the funeral. Just a few days. They're talking about he's risen. They're talking. And then he just pops up right in the middle. How would you feel if one of your relatives just popped up? Peace be unto you. Think about it. Would you have thought you saw a ghost? <laughs> Are, do you like ghosts? Are you afraid of ghosts? I mean, ghost bushes would say, I ain't afraid of no ghosts, All right? But here... He pops up and he says, peace be unto you. He just pops up. All right, we're going to talk about this in a moment. Peace be unto you. How, how wise is our Lord? Before they even start to feel a little bit of fear. He says, peace be unto you. Before we realize that we're sinners under the wrath of God heading to hell, he already has established peace with God the Father for us. He says, peace be unto you. Look at sub point A, the undeniable revelation of his finished work in the resurrected mediator of peace. He says, peace be unto you. He has already established peace. He has already accomplished the issue between sinful man and God. This, this enmity, this war. And by the way, we are born in sin, brothers and sisters, shaping in iniquity. We, don't, we, come, we might come out looking cute, but we're cursed. We're little vipers in theological diapers. We come out of the womb speaking lies. You thought that when the child is crying and breathing for the first time and starts saying goo goo gaga, you thought they were saying something nice, but they really was cussing you out. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Babies don't come into the world laughing. They come into the world crying. Do they want to be here? No. <laughs> Just think about it. And here, and, it, and we need a Savior. We need God to actually raise us from the dead, to come and get us, to quicken us, to unite us to him. We needed God to deal with his, his anger issue, and his anger issue was rooted in his holiness. He was angry with our sins, and he's angry with the wicked every single day. There is no peace for the wicked, and Christ came, and he was treated like a wicked sinful man though without sin at all because he was the only righteous son of God hanging between heaven and hell under the wrath of God for vile rebel sinners like us that was God dealing with his anger that was God dealing with his anger issue and Jesus became our propitiation he satisfied divine anger and he turned a frowny face into a smiley face children See, see, this is, this, is what, this is what we mean by the gospel of peace that we shod our feet with when we are standing as soldiers for Christ. See, our Lord stood in their midst as the mediator does, and he says, peace be unto you. This Melchizedek, this great high priest, stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. 
Who needs a little bit of peace? <laughs> I do. Who needs a little bit of rest? Who wants to stop going after idols and trying to find your satisfaction in things and in drugs and in drink and in men and in sex and in all these different... Who wants to stop your search and find your rest and your peace in Christ? He says, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Now, here's a question that I, that, that I have, brothers and sisters. Look, look at subpoint B. I want you to look at subpoint B. He is our peace. He is our peace. And subpoint B in your outline, it says, the unbelieving reaction of fear, trembling, and doubt of the men. Now, here's the thing. My wife, I love my wife. Every now and then I scare her on accident. <laughs> Every now and then. Sometimes it's on purpose. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't like it but every now and then I walk into the house and she's doing something you know just minding her own business and then and then she'll turn oh oh <laughs> announce yourself <laughs> brother <laughs> now she believes that I'm alive right <laughs> she believes I'm alive but she just doesn't realize I'm there <laughs> Okay? <laughs> she doesn't realize I'm there. And I think this is kind of the explanation here when we think about this. But I'll ask a question here because there's so much more to comp comprehend regarding this. Why did they respond the way that they responded? Why did they? They just got done high-fiving each other and, 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 and dancing in their sandals and stuff. Jesus is risen. They're jumping up and down, you know, in, in their gowns and stuff. And, and, and they're just having a good old time. And they, 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 yes, it makes sense. Yes, be filled with joy, right? Be filled with joy. We must be filled with joy once we realize that he is what? Risen. We must be. But how quick they shifted. How quick they shifted. Why? What happened there? Now, there's a couple of explanations I have. I, I gave you an analogy of one <laughs> and me accidentally scaring my wife. But I believe that not everyone among them believed that he rose bodily. And there are a lot of people that say they believe in the resurrection but don't believe he rose bodily. Okay? And they're still under the wrath of God. Which is a, so, so, so when, when our Lord appears, this is a mercy from the Lord. He's about to correct some things. He's about to arrest some things. Go with me back to Mark chapter 16. I want you to see it. Mark 16. Because I didn't read the whole of what I was reading, but I want you to see it. I want you to see it. In Mark Chapter 16, look at verse 12, and this is about those men that were on the road of Emmaus. I want you to see it. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither did they what? Whoa. And look at verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto eleven as they sat at meat, and he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which seen him after he was risen. You see that? So when he appears in Luke 24, it is a rebuke. It is a rebuke. Because he doesn't just appear and say, peace be unto you. But he reads their emotions, he reads their thoughts, he sees their face, he sees their mannerisms, and he actually begins to address those things because they should have believed the report all the way. The question is, brothers and sisters, do you believe the report all the way? Is he truly risen? Are we half-hearted in our belief? Are we tiptoeing the line in our belief? Are we living like he's risen? Are you living in fear? 
Are you living like he's risen and like he's in control and has all authority? Or are you petrified? Are you filled with fear? Are you, do you believe that he's truly risen? Or are you walking in a strong delusion? Saying that he's risen, but you're acting like you need to help him with your life. See, this is important. Go, so I'm, I'm just making mentioning of, uh, of all of this because here's what happens. Right after he, he says, peace be unto you. In verse 37 in, ver, in uh, Luke 24, it says, but they were terrified and affrightened. And suppose that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Now, why on earth would our Lord ask that if he already knows the answer? It's not so he can actually find out information. It's because he's, he's, he's actually checking them. He's letting them know you shouldn't be troubled right now. You just got done saying he's risen. You shouldn't be afraid right now. You shouldn't be thinking that you're looking at a spirit right now. You should have believed the report and believed the scriptures fully. This was talked about. This is why, this is where he's going. Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Brothers and sisters, they were petrified. Because some of them didn't believe. I mean, Name one person that didn't believe. Doubting Thomas. <laughs> and his appearance was a correction to Thomas. In fact, I'll give you one more verse, and I'm going to read it to you. Matthew 28, verse 16 through 17, he says, it says that the, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. I'll let you guys turn there. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's all good. I, 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 do, I do want you to see it. I do want you to see it. Go ahead. Turn there. Uh, Matthew chapter um, 28. If anyone ever tells you to turn to Moses chapter 3, um, <laughs> just know that uh, they don't know the word of God. Run away. Quick. Uh, <laughs> Moses chapter 3. It's Matthew 28. Um, look at verse 16. I want you to see it. Verse 16. Here we have it. In verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they what? But some what? He was in their presence, in their midst, and they still doubted. Now, let me ask you this question, brothers and sisters, because it may sound appalling to you. But can doubt exist with faith at the same time? Can it? What about that father that had the demoniac son that, 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 that was trying to make him commit suicide? Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And this father said, I believe, but help thou my what? Because he had some doubts. And the disciples have a little, they have some doubts. Like what they're seeing is unbelievable. <laughs> it's one thing to talk it, it's one thing to realize it. Have you realized that Jesus is risen? See, this is the point here. They're realizing that the report is actually real. More real than life itself. And Jesus is asking them, why are you afraid? Why are these thoughts rising up in your heart? They were terrified. This is what it literally says. They were terrified. They were fluttered. Like flying off into unrealistic, irrational behavior. That's not you, though. Like, the term in the Greek 
It, it, it means that for a moment they were psychologically detached from reality. Has it ever happened to you? So you can understand how they are feeling at this point. The resurrected Lord will unravel you by his very presence. Y'all remember in the book of Revelation when he appeared unto John, John fell as a dead man. <laughs> like, you know what? No. <laughs> I'm done. He appeared before me right now? I'm done. See, when our Lord appears, this is not a cute thing. It's a serious. It's a, it's a holy thing. It's a real thing. And he will appear one day. He's coming back. And everyone's going to unravel but his elect. And if some of his elect begin to un unravel, he'll keep them. <laughs> Just what, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> that's so good isn't it because we thinking about it right now like oh you know what <laughs> I'm weak but the Lord is strong isn't he because what he did with his disciples here is he kept them he kept them from falling off the deep end they were alarmed they were started they were terrified they responded as though they never seen this before. They responded as this, this is, this is unbelievable. I cannot believe my eyes right now. And not only this, but they were not just terrified simply because they were seeing him, but they thought they saw a spirit. Isn't that right? That's exactly what it says in verse 37. They thought they saw a ghost. So they believe in spirits. <laughs> and, <laughs> so their theology is showing in their fear they believe in spirits they believe in ghosts and they thought they saw one this is not the first time they got scared and thought they saw a ghost Jesus was walking on the water and, and, and they were rowing really hard and he was, he was walking and they are like ah because they thought they saw a spirit and in their mind if I see a spirit I'm done I'm about to die Basically what they saw, they didn't see a, risen, a bodily risen Christ, but they saw a risen spirit of Christ whose body was still dead. So they saw the spirit in their mind. Now think about this. Have you ever saw something and you thought what you saw was true and it wasn't true at all? It wasn't rooted in reality. And if those things are true to you, it's going to affect you. Isn't that right? There's a such thing as absolute truth. And there is one reality. But we are weak and fickle wicker baskets where we actually fall sometimes under delusions, where we actually think something is real and it is not. And the only person that can snap you back into reality is the Lord. Whenever you see someone out of it, beg the Lord to snap them out of it. Because he's the only one that can do it. So he's the solution to our fears. He's the solution to our phobias. It says that they, they were filled with fear. It means that they were locked in a state of fear. They were gripped by a fearful state of mind. How many understand that? Where you cannot get out of the way you feel about what you are thinking about. See, those who have anxiety know what I'm talking about. Those who suffer depression, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you can't get out of it. And People don't understand you. Sometimes we just need to call on the name of the Lord to get us out, to help us see clearly, to help us calm down, to help us settle down. 
And our Lord does that. I want you to see it in subpoint C as we are closing. And it's point number three is very simple. Very much, very much so simple that, that I'm probably just going to preach it on the way out. Look at, look at subpoint C. Subpoint C in your outline. I want you to see the unfailing reasoning of the Lord through the facts of his bodily resurrection. So he not only asked them, why are you troubled and why do your thoughts arise in your heart? Be, he, he goes into solution mode. He doesn't just criticize them and say, why are you this way? You shouldn't be this way. See, a lot of times what people do is they love to criticize but never provide solutions. Right. This is this is just true. They love to criticize, but never provide solutions. And, you know, those people are not healthy for you. They're not. But our Lord is the most healthiest person that we need by his stripes for what we need him. And so he lets them know. He says, why are you this way? Then he goes into solution mode and he says in verse thirty nine, behold, my hands and my feet. That it is I myself, handle me and see. So there's a, he, wants you to, he wants you to see from two different vantage points. Behold, with your eyes, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. This see is about experience. See for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. I love this. He is providing the highest proof of his resurrection to his disciples. This is amazing. He's saying, examine me. <laughs> see that I'm not a spirit. How did he know that they thought he was a spirit? Because he's God. He reads thoughts. They didn't say anything. He read it, he provided the solution. Examine me, see that I'm not a spirit, and that my resurrection is not simply spiritual, but actual, it's bodily. This glorious body, which is a resurrected body, had the ability of perfect adaptation to any environment. So I want to talk about this for a moment. Just think about this for a moment. This body, had Jesus had this resurrected body? was able to get up from the dead and out of the tomb so that no human being saw him. It wasn't rolled back. The stone wasn't rolled back so that he was able to get out, but <laughs> the stone was rolled back so that people would see that he was already out. Yeah. Think about that. He was able to leave a locked room. What kind of body is that? What kind of body is that? Then, I want you to mark. He appeared in a different form to the two on the road of Emmaus. So much so that they didn't recognize him until they broke bread with him. Because he wanted them to believe the scriptures. He adapted his body. Not only that, but in verse 31 of Luke 24, after they realized it was him, he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> Wait, a physical body vanished out of their sight. Explain that to me. Perfect adaptation. Not only this, but in our text, he appeared before the disciples while they were talking about his resurrection. He didn't walk in the room. The door was already shut, according to John chapter 20, verse 19. Probably locked. He just appeared. Yeah. What kind of body is that? And yet, he did all of this, and he was not a spirit. But he was raised from the dead bodily. And he had on his body the marks of his death to prove it was him. The marks of his love for you and me to prove that he died for sinners like you and me. Not only this, but he challenged them. Touch me. Touch me. 
handle me. That was probably the only time the Lord told him to handle him. <laughs> Touch me. Handle me. And see that it's not, I'm not just the spirit. So when we talk about the resurrected body, we're not talking about an invisible, intangible body. We're talking about a physical, spiritual body. That's what we're talking about here. This is a different kind of body we've never experienced. And those of us who have aches and pains, those of us who are getting old, those of us that actually experience pain, we cannot wait until we get that body. Think about it. He was able, he was able to eat. <laughs> Perfect adaptation. He was able to eat some fish to prove. Now, if a spirit ate that fish, what would happen? fall right down on the floor <laughs> right there's a significance to why he's saying what he's saying letting them know I have a body not only this he was able to transport from heaven from the from the earthly realm to the heavenly realm immediately faster than the speed of light he was able to ascend on a cloud into heaven in that same body. Now, if you stood on a cloud, what would happen to you? <laughs> like, you got to meditate on the kind of resurrected body that he had. And it transported him as the son of man to the ancient of days to receive his crown and his dominion and his kingdom and be worshipped and glorified forever and ever as the sovereign king of the universe. Think about this. This is the body that he had. This is the body that he was, that was standing before them. Handle me, touch me, see I'm not just a spirit. Give me some fish. Let me eat it so you can see it's not going to fall right through me. I am here. What a glory because that's the same body we're going to get. I was talking to my son last night. I said, you know, we, we, we love watching Marvel superheroes. We love watching Superman. We love watching, you know, Iron Man. We love watching Batman and, and, and so on and so forth. The, the term man is at the end of every single superhero. And they got super powers, the power to be invisible, the power to walk through doors, the, 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 the power to adapt <laughs> and, be, and, and become something else. Those emblems and those pictures of those powers actually point to the resurrected body we've been promised. See this, it, 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 and who loves superhero movies? Come on, come on. See, oh, I, I, see, I see some of my sisters. Okay, we're going to have a superhero movie night one of these days. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. But that's where you would have a body that won't corrupt, that won't need to sleep, won't need to eat. Therefore, eating will not be because you're hungry. It's because you are celebrating the Lord. <laughs> won't need any water or wine, but we're going to enjoy some wine with the Lord, aren't we? To celebrate him. And we won't get tipsy because we have a glorified body. We won't need to sleep. We won't need to go to the gym. <laughs> we, <laughs> I'm gonna say, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, <laughs> we, we won't need any protein shakes. We won't need to go to school. Some of y'all kids are like, yes! because you'll be in a state of perfection with a glorified body where you are in the school of Christ forever. Perfectly seeing him and knowing him and loving him to the fullest. Beholding his glory. This is the body that we're going to receive because Christ is what? Risen. Oh, the young folks, I know, the young folks are like, yeah, you know what? I like the superhero part, but don't understand the aches and pains yet. Lord, help them get there. <laughs> and me too some of y'all looking at me like young man but I do have some aches and pains now I'm just to tell you I do have some aches and pains I do I do my wife will tell you she, she'll tell you I do I messed myself up playing basketball one day um, but here 
our Lord makes it very clear, it is me. This is the infallible proof. Point number three, and we're done right here, the clarifying confirmation of the Bible's testimony of his resurrection, fulfilling prophecy. All our Lord does here, and I'm just going to, like I said, close this down right here. All he does after he um, demonstrates to them that he is alive is he doesn't want them to their faith to be in his physical body, even though, even though he has a physical body. He, he doesn't want their uh, faith to be in their experience of touching his body. He wants their faith to be in the word of God, in the scriptures. See, when Doubting Thomas saw the Lord, and he said, look, Put your hand in the piercing of my hand and take your hand and thrust it into my side and be not doubtful, but believing. And he bowed and he said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you've seen me, do you believe? Blessed are they who have not seen. And yet what? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe the word of God? It is this, this book, this blessed book from Genesis to Revelation, that we have testimony after testimony after testimony of the sufferings and the glories of Christ. What do you think he was saying to the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It shall crush your head and you shall bruise its heel. It was talking about the serpent bruising the heel of Christ in his crucifixion and Jesus crushing the serpent's head in his resurrection. That's what that passage was talking about. You want to look at Jonah in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights and then he was spit onto seashore? You're looking at the death of Jesus Christ for three days and three nights and him raising from the dead with all power in his hands. You're looking at all of these things. Jesus prophesied through David by the Spirit saying that you shall show me the path of life in Psalm 16. In your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He was talking about and craving about the resurrection unto glory. He was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what Jesus wants them to hold fast to. Because his body is no longer here. He's in glory at the right hand of God. Do you believe his word? Have you repented of your sins? Because this is the demand of the sovereign king. Have you repented of your sins, sinner? Have you said, yes, Lord, you're right. I am a sinner. I love my sin. And I believe that I am under your wrath. Save me. I believe and I trust in the efficacious blood of your son. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I know you accepted his sacrifice because you rose him from the dead. I know that I'm accepted before you if I put my trust in the living and risen Lord. How many of you have done that? How many have turned away from your sins? have walked away, have ran away, and turned to Christ. How many of you have closed with him? Have you closed with him? If you haven't, close with him today. Before he returns. Because he will return. Why? Because he is what? Risen. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you so much for your word and the truth as it is in Christ. We ask that you would please persuade us as you did the disciples and as you persuade all of your people by your word of the bodily resurrected Lord who sits at your right hand. Father, we thank you so much for your word and the truth as it is in Christ and how it penetrates our hearts and it illumines our minds and it causes us to comprehend what you already said. Lord, continue to say it over and over again to us. Wonderful words of life. 
Help us, Lord, to lay hold of the promise of eternal life that's found in the resurrected Lord. Lord, those that are under the sound of my voice, those that, that are new in the house, bless them, Lord. Keep them, Lord. Save them. And if there's anyone among us that, that appears to be Christian and that's pretending, Lord, save us. Save them. Sanctify them. Justify them. Lord, and Lord, we thank you so much because you save who you will and nobody stops your saving hand. Irresistibly draw today. Thank you so much for raising your son. Jesus, thank you so much for raising yourself. Spirit of God, thank you so much for raising the son. God, thank you for raising Christ. To your name belongs all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to have the offering and then we're going to sing the doxology and, and, and closing out. <clears throat> every Sunday that you are really gifted at this because that is what's up. Did we sing that? We haven't sang it today. But we sang it before. So we could sing it again. Okay. I, I went kind of long so I'm going to let him go. I'm not going to hog time. <laughs> Lord is good, isn't he, saints? If you would, stand with me. We're going to sing the doxology. Now, those who are new in our, um, our, our hymnal, our blessed hymnal here, um, after you turn past the uh, beginning pages of the acknowledgement, you'll see um, two hymns on one page. One says, Glory be to the Father, and the one at the bottom is, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That is the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow is the one that we're going to sing right now on our way out. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here be. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Father, we do praise you. Lord Jesus, we do praise you. Spirit of God, we praise you. Triune God, we praise you. From whom all blessings flow. And we ask, Lord, that on this day you would help us to uh, make much of the resurrection of Christ, not only in our speech, but in our um, living, in our fellowship. Help us to make the necessary application that will glorify the Son and that will exalt you. We pray that you would give us safe traveling mercies from this place, but never from, our, never from your presence. Cause his face to shine upon us. Be gracious to us. Lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins, the freedom by which we've been set free. Help us to walk in it as if we rule with Christ in this day. Bless your people, 
your church all around the world that calls upon your name out of a pure heart. Thank you so much for your goodness. And Lord, continue to draw your people back together again every Sunday as you, as you, as you continually do because it is the application of the resurrection of Christ. Thank you so much for this church that you have provided and that you are building. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for a love for Christ. Thank you, Lord, for a hope for glory. Thank you for your patience for us. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you, Lord, for your sanctifying favor in our life. And Lord, we praise you still even in bad times, even with those that are afflicted. May you grace them to praise you like, like, like Job said, though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. Grace us to trust you more. In Jesus' name, in your church said, amen. Amen. amen.